The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website at agingpartners at lincoln.ne.gov. I'm Harlan Johnson, and my guest today is Sriani Tidball, a multi-talented young lady who has been doing missionary work in her home country in Sri Lanka, and now has taken on a project of human trafficking right here in Nebraska. Today, I continue my series on Alzheimer's disease. I'm Kristen Stowes. Please stay with me as we learn about the wide range of qualities and responsibilities of being an effective caregiver. From Lee Nyberg, a partner of Home Care Assistance. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake, and we have a very special show for you today. The Mayor's Arts Awards are coming up, and with us today is the winner of the Legacy Award. His name, you know it, is is Ed Love, and he's going to be playing the clarinet. So, join us, won't you? Hello, I'm Tom White. Change is one of the only things that we know is going to be constant throughout life. And today I'll be talking with Sandy Lutz from Aging Partners, and we'll be talking all about how to cope and adapt to change. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Welcome back to Live and Learn. I'm Harlan Johnson. My guest today is a multi-talented woman, and I first got acquainted with her when she was at the lead center. She was in charge of their promotion and advertising and putting together a book, uh, advertising all of the shows at the lead center. And she was there for about 10 years. And then she became a, a chief editor of three different magazines. She is an assistant professor now at the University of Nebraska, been there for the last seven years. And she and her husband have been involved with going back to Sri Lanka and doing missionary work, doing housing and many things there with a nonprofit that she's involved with. So, uh, Sri Lani, welcome to Live and Learn. Thank you for being here. Well, you're most welcome. It's a pleasure. All right. Now, uh, I mentioned that you've been going to Sri Lanka for 35 years. Tell us about what you, what you do there. Well, um, Tom, my husband and I, we've been quite involved with helping the poor on the beach. And we started kind of small, just helping one family. And before we knew what, we were working with the poor. And, you know, in areas like feeding and uh, education and then working with, you know, child labor. There was things like child labor, child prostitution, all of those issues that you have when you're, you know, dealing with poverty and just trying to survive. And so we started just helping one family at a time. And before we knew what, we were helping hundreds of families. And then when the tsunami hit us, at that time we were working with over 2,000 children. And uh, the tsunami just hit all our children and our families on the beach and luckily we lost none but we had um, 1500 homes go into the ocean that day so you know it's uh, been a real growing experience but we love every minute of it with all that you're doing how do you find time to go back to sri lanka well for a while uh, we were actually living there half the year and living here half the year uh, we were just, you know, juggling things, but my husband loves Sri Lanka too, and we raised our ch four children in both countries, so it, it's worked out okay. Okay, now, you talk about housing, and you blew me away when you talked about the homes that you built there. Well, they were part of the, uh, this, the reconstruction of homes after the tsunami, because when I told you 1,500 homes went into the ocean, you know, I got involved with the rebuilding and restoration and reconstruction of homes. And uh, we were able to actually do that. It was, you know, money from all over the world. And, you know, I can write grants and find ways to help people. And everybody had such compassion for people who got affected by the tsunami. Because, you know, 11 years ago, nobody had heard of the word. And it was the day after Christmas. And people, you know, talk about media and mass media and sharing a story. Everybody in the world was watching it. All right. Now, this lady has an architect degree. And so you put that to good use in developing the housing. Man. Actually, I did. And I was really lucky because my degree that I received, my, I have, you know, one from UNL and then one from Sri Lanka. 
because a lot of my friends were in key positions because they stayed on, they were Sri Lankans. And so they were able to help me with really good land and help with roads and, and utilities and services. So we ended up building architect design homes for these people who are living in the slums, who lost everything. And now when I go back, it's just so heart-wrenching to see how a new home in a, in a sort of a credible location makes a huge difference for somebody who lived in poverty. Well, it makes a big difference in their lives, I'm sure, and they say thanks to you for that. Now, you've been doing this before the, the Tusami, uh, and you mentioned education, you mentioned food. Uh, what are some of the things that, uh, that you uh, basically raise money for in your nonprofit? Well, the thing is, you know, you realize education is a, a marvelous way to alleviate poverty. So we started having a school on the beach for dropouts and kids that weren't going to school. And in Sri Lanka, even though education is free, if you don't have a uniform or don't have pencils and books or underwear or shoes, you can't go to school. So we tried, uh, we did this program where we had non-formal um, education for kids who couldn't go back to school and then formal education for kids that we were able to get them to catch up and then send them back to school. So since then, we have been watching over their situation and making sure they had the necessary you know, equipment and clothing and sometimes breakfast and lunch to be able to go back to school every day. And we're still very involved with it. We're still doing the same things. And you and Tom have been personally involved as a pipeline for funds, for families that wanted to make donations for, to do your work there. Uh, you're to be commended for that. Well, you know, for Tom and me, we have personally been blessed. We've never needed to raise money for ourselves. We've had jobs. But to be able to help others has been really a joy. All right. Now, a whole other uh, new side of you that I was not familiar with, but you've got involved with human trafficking. Now, tell me about this. So when in Sri Lanka, we had most of the forms of trafficking going on for years and nobody called it trafficking. And then when I came here, I was so surprised that there was human trafficking going on in Nebraska. We say this is the good life, right? Oh yeah, Holland. right here in Nebraska, sure. Right, and then you realize that this buying and selling of human flesh is something that is universal and even in our own backyard. So finally, I'm very happy to say that this, that you know, the government of Nebraska. So I'm looking at our new governor and our uh, attorney general and our senators like, you know, Patty Panzing Brooks and Adam Morfeld. And they've all joined this fight and they're saying, we are not going to let our kids be sold in Nebraska. So I'm hoping that we will have some laws and some things will change here. Otherwise, we are like everybody else. All right. Now, uh, you've done some research on this? You're, you're quite right. knowledgeable. Well, it? I've done some research projects, one for Microsoft and recently for the mm -hmm. Omaha uh, Women's Fund, looking at, you know, we, recently we're just finishing up a study where we've talked to 22 girls in Nebraska who were trafficked, who's telling us their story. 22 girls right here in Nebraska. Oh, yeah. Oh, and there's a lot more, but I, these girls were willing to talk. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Okay. Oh, yeah. And just to understand, you know, what is, does it feel like to be a survivor? Because we are so good at criminalizing girls saying you are a prostitute, and it's not true. They're prostituted girls. There's a whole big difference. They're owned by someone else, and they have no say over themselves. And so we need to, like, change the way we look at things and say our girls are not for sale. So some of the research has really helped bring some of these things up. And I've been part of a research team at UNL where we have been doing some work for the last seven years on this. Great team of people. We've been meeting almost every week for the last seven years. And, and we have a conference every year just wanting to know what is out there and you know what we want to know and what we need to know and what other people have done research on and we share this information and data and together we are here to say we are abolitionists we want to change this situation now as i get the scenario the picture these are young girls that are at given an opportunity for a job as a housekeeper or something 
And when no, they come... No, we're not talking about this. We're talking that in America, this is a Department of Justice statistics. This is not mine. Every year, two to 300,000 girls between 12 and 14, these are the girls next door, are taken into prostitution by okay. force. So this we're talking about... There's a separate situation of girls coming from overseas. No, we're talking of young girls in middle school being taken to be sold. As you say, a girl's right here next door. All right. Now, uh, while you're doing these things, you're a busy lady. Uh, I just happen to have an old copy of uh, uh, Lincoln Today. That's one of the magazines that you're the editor of. Uh, a couple of others. Yeah, right now that's the only magazine I work okay, on. Okay, okay. And it's a magazine. That we are going into our 25th year coming up. And it's a lifestyle magazine about the city of Lincoln that Tom and I just love. And it just talks about, you know, everything from art and where to go eat and where you can have fun. So that's our magazine. All right. Uh, 25 years that you've been doing that. Uh, and you're a busy lady. Uh, but thank you for coming and being on the Live and Learn Show and talking about all that you do. I, we've been wanting to do this for a long time. And finally, I get the opportunity to catch you while you're here and have you come and be on the Live and Learn Show. So thank you very much. Thanks, Harlan. Thanks for what you do, too. <laughs> I know that, you know. Well, and remember, it's never too late to live and to learn. What are the qualities needed to be a caregiver for someone with Alzheimer's disease? Compassion, patience, stamina? We will learn that it takes all of that and so much more as I welcome Lee Nyberg from Home Care Assistance. So glad to have you here today. Thank you, it's great to be here. Wonderful. Could you please tell us what brought you into the caregiving arena? Sure, uh, my background's in marketing and strategy and I came to this business because I was taking care of my parents long distance in Georgia mm -hmm. and they had great caregivers but they needed training and supervision and so that led us to creating home care assistance. Wonderful, so you have come to it with a passion and I yes. like that. Yes. Although this is my third segment on Alzheimer's disease, I think it is really important to start our conversation by stressing that Alzheimer's is more than just memory loss. Let's look at a graphic as you address the many issues that encompass Alzheimer's disease. Okay. Um, it is a form, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. It's the most common form, as you, as you know, and I'm sure most people are aware. And um, there are many more issues, though, than just uh, short-term memory that are affected. While uh, memory and short-term memory is the first thing that comes to mind, for most people, and it's also the first thing people experience, seem to at least be noticeably experiencing. Um, there's also executive function that's affected, and this is an area that we all use to plan and um, complete tasks. And so when you see this in someone who's affected by dementia, you see them uh, being unable to organize, um, unable to, to do very simple tasks, like even something so simple as making change they really? can't do mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. um, attention is another thing. This is something that we use to put information into our memory filing cabinet, but if you can't pay attention to something long enough to remember it, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can't put it into your filing cabinet. Sure. Um, language is another area, and this could be reading, writing, or spoken language, and I might not be able to find a word that I want to use or, or understand what I'm looking at. And lastly, there's visual spatial perception. And this is really problematic because someone is unable to understand the relationship between objects. So they oh. might try to climb over a door threshold, even though it's level with the ground. They yes. aren't able to perceive how tall it is, and that can mm -hmm. cause them to trip and fall. So a caregiver has to address many issues other than just memory issues. Yes, yes, absolutely. If someone has decided to be a caregiver for a loved one, what is important for them to understand from the get-go? 
the very first thing I, I want everyone to know is this is a disease that could be with a person for two to 20 years. It's wow. incurable mm -hmm. and it's just going to get progressively worse. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's really the basic of it. And so if you, if you think that you want to be a caregiver and you, this is a little a short term thing, like it used to be for our grandparents okay. mm -hmm. or their grandparents, it's not that way. People are living for, on average, five to 10 years with this disease. So mm -hmm. we're talking about a very long-term commitment. Yes. Um, what is important to do in the very beginning if your loved one is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease? Well, the very first thing to do is to, to get together with an attorney and mm -hmm. a financial planner or a trust officer and face up to getting all your ducks in a row really mm -hmm. because there will come a time when the person with Alzheimer's needs complete care and it's best for them to be able to have a say in what that care should be mm -hmm. and help plan for how it should be carried out and how it's going to be paid for and doing all that. That's an important part of of maintaining the control in their lives as long as possible. And I think that would be of great comfort to the caregiver as well, knowing that their loved one is expressing their own wishes and they are able to sign documents on their own. Yes, absolutely. Because, because this is a progressive disease, there mm -hmm. will be a time when a person isn't able to make decisions and isn't able to legally um, mm -hmm. sign documents. Right. And so taking care of this while you have as many cognitive faculties as possible mm -hmm. is, sure. is important. And families who say, well, we'll just do this later and then never get around to it. Sometimes you don't have a later. Right, mm -hmm. and they might find themselves in, um, actually in court trying to oh. get this sorted out and that's very that painful very for difficult. everyone. Yeah. I know you said then reading, reading the living environment is so important and you mentioned something about that you need to shrink the person's living environment. What do you mean by that? Well, this is a person who is going to become increasingly confused and increasingly unable to interpret what is, that the space around them is really their own. And so it's important to take out things that aren't important to them anymore. Okay. So if there are lots of little objects that could be, that don't have meaning for them, uh -huh take those out. Okay. If, there, if there's a lot of clutter, like old newspapers and books and things mm -hmm. like that that aren't of use to this person anymore, mm -hmm. take those out and maybe replace them with things that they can still interact with and still be engaged with. I see. Yeah. And of course, eliminating any falling hazards is so important. And we always think of falling in terms of the uh, physical damage it might do. But is it true that the trauma of a fall can actually exacerbate this underlying medical condition of Alzheimer's. Oh, absolutely. Um, but people don't realize so often when they fall, they hit their heads. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you can, you can have someone end up in a wheelchair and not remember that they actually don't know how to walk anymore, or aren't able to walk anymore, mm -hmm. and continue to try to walk. And so it, it is very important early on in a diagnosis to get those trip hazards out because one of the first things that um, happens with some people is their gait's affected. Okay, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. Lee, I think we're going to go on to the balanced care method right now. I know you like to use that method to help caregivers and their duties. We'll put yeah. up a graphic at this time so that you can address the five different overlapping areas. Yes, yes. Um, this, is, this is our philosophy of care and um, it, it's really founded in good nutrition because doctors will tell you that food is as important as medicine. Mm -hmm. And with this is a good foundation for helping people live the best possible life they can with whatever their condition is. And when people are first, um, often first diagnosed with Alzheimer's, they're young, they're in their mm -hmm. 60s. And so they have a lot of energy and a lot of physical strength and it's important for them to get exercise. And as they move through this disease, that will change, but still getting as much exercise as is appropriate for their physical condition is good. And whether, even if it's just something like walking, mm -hmm. you know, my, my parents used to play golf oh. and my mom wasn't very good, but it was a good exercise for both of them to be out yes. in, in the fresh air. 
So certainly. Um, then social ties are sorry. Um, the next chunk of this is mental engagement, and this is really important that it evolve as the person's disease progresses because certainly, you know, when someone's early in their diagnosis, they can do things like volunteer, uh -huh. and uh, when they are in the middle stage of their diagnosis, they can. Um, there are going to be some puzzles that they can still work on, whether they're just a jigsaw or uh, other kinds of things that they can still do. Mm -hmm. there, so there are different levels of engagement that can be helpful to, to keep this person as mentally active as possible. Mm -hmm. And social ties is the next really important part of this. And, okay. and I think it's very easy to say, well, this person doesn't know if we're here or not, why should we go visit them? Mm -hmm. And that is, that's the last thing that is, true this is still a human being and they still need t human touch and to know that they are cared for Absolutely. so yeah. that's very important and the last part of that is connected uh, its purpose and uh, so often when someone has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's in the early early period they do feel that they've lost their purpose because they may have to stop work and so uh, that's a good time to replace that with volunteer work as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And then as they move through their the progression of their disease, maybe they can still set the table or help fold laundry or sweep. Mm -hmm. there, there are things that they can do to continue to be a part of the family and part of, yes. part of the family life. So keep them contributing as right. long as they possibly can, I'm right. sure. Yes, yes. yes. I know the decision to move a loved one into a care facility is a very personal one, but once that decision has been made, how does someone handle the unhappiness of that individual, especially if they keep saying, I just want to go home? Yeah, this is really hard and, and it's really common. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes people are angry when they're asking this question mm -hmm. and sometimes they're just sad and, th and they really seem befuddled and I always, ask people to try to look beyond what the person's saying to what they're feeling. And okay. oftentimes when people are saying they want to go home, they're talking about a lack of comfort. They want someone to say it's all right and they want to feel it's all right and they want to be in a surrounding they recognize, but because of their mental capacity, they don't recognize where they are. They don't put together they've had to move. So it's a good time to say, well, tell me what it is that you, that is so important to you about home. Tell me what it is that you enjoy when you're home. And draw the person out and possibly draw them into a memory. And maybe they're going to say, well, I liked cooking dinner for my husband. Uh -huh. Then you can say, well, what was, what was your favorite thing to prepare for your husband? Or, and if you need to use present tense because they're using present tense, then do it. I see. Even if you're their son, don't say, Mom, don't you remember? You yeah. can say, Virginia, I seem to recall you liked cooking Tom's favorite mm. pork chops. Okay. And then she can say yes. And you can, well, what did he like about those <laughs> yeah. so much? Sure. So. so try to get that general question down to a specific. Yes, and also into, into a memory that is positive okay. and okay. takes them out of puts them into that place where they feel cozy again. Oh, sure, yeah. sure. You just want them to be comfortable. Right. Mm -hmm. What do you say about family or friends who offer help? Is that a good thing? Oh, gosh, <laughs> yes. And, be, and it's tricky, too, because uh -huh. sometimes, sometimes people, um, when they're a caregiver, they think they're the only ones that can mm. be the caregiver, and, and they can accept help. And so if they can get into a place where they have, they have an easy option, and a hard option, or at least more difficult, like if you were to say, well, what can you do for me? And if I say, well, would you please go buy my groceries this week or mow my grass? That's an easy option. Mm -hmm. A harder option might be, could you come and stay with my mom for an hour or two while I go get my hair cut and I'll leave activities for you. Okay. You know, so mm -hmm. have some options when someone asks you that so that you can take them up on their generous offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for those who are offering help, it's just, it's such a relief for the caregiver just to have a little bit of a rest, but even if it's an hour. Yes, it yes, makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. It gives difference. them a breather. Yeah, that's right. Um, if the caregiver feels a support group would help, what is your recommendation there? Oh, absolutely. Do that and call the Alzheimer's Association and tell them what kind of support group you're looking for. 
Now, sometimes support groups are more social. Sometimes okay. they're more about education. And um, you know, a friend of mine doesn't want to go to a support group because she thinks her husband would not like it that she needs support in taking care of him. So mm. she has called it her education group. Oh. <laughs> and so it's okay for her to go to her education group. Yes. So find a way to make it work for you so that you get what you need out of okay. it. Okay. So different support yeah. groups offer different yes. kinds of activities and support. So yes. find the right group. Yes. We will put uh, the number of the Alzheimer's Association on screen as well as the Parkinson's disease number for support for those caregivers. Uh, Lee, our time is, is drawing short. I can't believe this is almost at the end, but we would like to hear your final thoughts on Alzheimer's okay. disease and on caregiving. Okay. The most important thing to do is to meet this person with Alzheimer's where they are and accept them where they are without expectations because they are probably doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. And it's important that as a caregiver, you know when you have to step back from being a caregiver so mm -hmm. that you can keep living too. Then yeah. that's very important and so hard to do, yeah. but important. Lee, thank you so much for all of your insight today. I know that you have helped a great many people. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. My final segment in this series will highlight what the future might hold for those with Alzheimer's disease. I'm Kristen Stowes. Please remember, it's never too late to live and learn. The Mayor's Arts Award are coming up on June the 15th right here in Lincoln. I'm Lita Powell Drake and our guest today um, are Lori McAllister from the Lincoln Arts Council and Ms. Hayfully <laughs> from the Legacy Retirement Centers. And we're going to be talking about the Mayor's Arts Award. And Lori, let me start with you and ask you, when did the Mayor's Arts Award begin? The first Mayor's Arts Award singular was presented in 1979 uh, to Helen Hagee. And uh, it was a Mayor's Choice Award. Uh, it remained that way for about five years and then uh, in 84, I think, they gave five awards, and this year we're going to be awarding 16 wow. honorees. Yes. Well, tell, tell me how the nomination process starts. I mean, who, who, who can nominate who? Actually, anyone in the community uh, can put forth a nomination. We've got a, a variety of uh, levels of creativity and different aspects of creativity that we honor. Um, from outstanding events and outstanding organizations uh, to youth, to seniors, uh, visual artists, performing artists, uh, as well as philanthropists and those that work behind the scenes and backstage to make the art happen. And so for those people who win, what do they get? Well, um, <laughs> uh, that, that actually, uh, in addition to just the honor and the recognition, they get an original piece of art. Uh, much, much like the one oh. that you, in fact, received was, uh, in 2001. That was Mayor Don Wesley, I remember uh, it so very clearly, but it was fantastic. very small compared to the big extravaganza that, that happens now. That's true. The event has certainly grown. In fact, I think 2001, the year that you were honored, was actually the last year that it was a lunch <laughs> event. Yeah, uh, it was lunch. <laughs> it was lunch. Uh, and now it's a meal on the main stage at, at the Lead Center. And the thing is, at the Lead Center, you are on the stage. Explain the feeling of being not a performer, but in a diner <laughs> and recipient of all the good food and everything that's going to happen, the feeling of being on the stage. Well, I'm sure for everyone it's a little bit different, um, but I, as someone who sat out in the seats and have watched a variety of performances on that stage, mm -hmm. it was just, uh, it was delightful to be behind the curtains. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
uh, it's really, uh, it's a large setting. The capacity is 400 people. Wow. Uh, and we're usually at capacity for the Mayor's Arts Awards, which is wonderful. But there's just a little bit of, uh, of stardust uh, in that place. It really makes it a special evening. Because for those of you who go to the Lead Center, you know, and you're sitting out in the audience, it's very different than being on that stage and looking up and seeing all the lights and the electrical units and everything that yes. to, goes into making a production. So it's very, very special. And you, my dear Tracy, <laughs> have made it even more special by honoring seniors. Would you tell us about the origin of the, the Legacy Award? Well, thank you for having me. And I have to tell you, I think this was really Lori's idea. She had come on behalf of the Lincoln Arts Council to the Legacy Retirement Communities to find out if there were some possibilities that we could work together with some volunteer opportunities. And while she was there, I think she found out the depth of the artistic interest of our residents. We have many former art teachers, many current artists, and, uh, who, and people who just appreciate art and love to see it in Lincoln. And, they, and I think that she met a few of the artists there. We have art shows in our communities, and she had the wonderful opportunity to see an art class in motion, if you will, while she was there. And we just kind of came up with the idea that this was a great opportunity to show that just because someone gets older doesn't mean they stop inspiring or creating artistic mm -hmm. achievement and whether that be in, I guess in any type of art form and so we came up with the opportunity to give the Legacy of Art Award to someone who is 55 or older in the Lincoln community and just someone who inspires and creates art in any form. And that person is Le Ed Love, who is the winner, and we're going to be hearing from him in just a few minutes. Uh, but there was a really special program last year, Lori, uh, that the Lincoln Community Playhouse offered. Would you explain the Penguin Project? Certainly. Uh, the Penguin Project is just amazing. It uh, facilitates uh, friendship as well as opportunity for young people um, who are differently abled. Uh, all of the cast uh, have are, are partnered with a peer mentor uh, so that they can appear on stage and uh, and fulfill that dream and so the production in 2015 was actually the Little Mermaid Junior and we had the entire cast with all of their mentors in full costume uh, performing two songs which was just amazing, uh, to say the least. They brought the house down. It's just so touching to see them all working together. Plus, they just did a magnificent job with the music. What mm -hmm. we found out later is that one of the young men who uh, had taken a lead role and, and was singing in these productions, actually his dream was to perform in the spotlight on the stage at the lead center. He's had an opportunity to do that twice, I understand. but we were there uh, for one of his dream come true moments as part of the Mayor's Arts Awards. It was amazing. All right, let's take a look at that now, the Penguin Project.
And the winner this year of the Legacy Award is Ed Love. And I know many of you have heard him play, he's extraordinary, and he's the director of the Nebraska Jazz Orchestra. So now here is Ed Love with the clarinet polka. <laughs> Did anyone ever tell you, Ed, you were full of hot air? Yes, <laughs> more than once. What's the status of the big bands today? There are perhaps more big bands in the country now than, or in the world now, than there ever have been because so many schools uh, have big band instruction, um, in addition to the marching band, the orchestra, and all that other stuff. Um, just about every middle school in Lincoln has a jazz band. Uh, all the high schools have jazz bands. Um, and certainly the university does. Mm -hmm. So kids are getting that kind of instruction and exposure to the music at an early age. And then there are big cities all over the country that have uh, professional big bands that do concerts and play for dances. And certainly Lincoln has the Nebraska Jazz Orchestra. Yes. And you happen to be? Uh, I happen to be a member of that band and its music director. I've, I've been in that band for 38 years. You're going to keep doing it until you get it right. Oh, boy, it could take a long time. I don't know. But uh, we're cele the NJO is celebrating its uh, 40th anniversary this year. We're Congratulations. excited about that. Yes. Well, if you would like to attend the Mayor's Arts Award, they're coming up. So you might want to jot this down to keep the dates in mind. It's coming up on Wednesday, June the 15th. And it'll be held at the Leeds Center for the Performing Arts on stage. You get to sit and eat on stage. The doors will open at 5.30. At 6.15 is the buffet dinner. And at 7.15, the program will start. Now, the deadline, mark this down if you're interested in going, and it's really a very special event, is May the 26th. For reservations, you can call 402 area code 434 2787. Or it's on the web at artscene.org slash events slash Mayor's Arts Award. Well, Art, thank you very much to you, Ed. We're You're looking welcome. forward to your presentation and congratulations on your award. You. And Laurie McAllister, you're doing a wonderful job with the, with the, uh, the Arts Council here in Lincoln. Thank you. And, and Terry Hefeli over at Legacy Estates, thank you so much for making this award available to him. Thanks, thank you very thank you. much. We really appreciate it. <laughs> okay, remember, it's never too late to live and learn. I'm Tom White. You know, change is one of the only constants in life. And my guest today is Sandy Lutz from Aging Partners. And today we're going to be talking all about change and transition for seniors especially. So, good afternoon, good Hi, evening, Tom. good morning. 
<laughs> <laughs> Whatever. It's really good to see you again, Tom. It's good to see you too, Sandy. Thanks for inviting me. So we're going to talk about change today and how to cope with change. So what would you say about change just as get us started here? Well, change starts from the very moment that we're born. It, mm -hmm. it never stops. And uh, change is uh, something that brings many people into our office at Aging Partners. Uh, many people experience uh, significant changes as they get older. But like I, said, ch like I said, change starts from the very moment that we're born. Change often entails uh, uh, different, uh, different uh, experiences related to your health, your wealth, and yourself. And what I want to talk about today is how we can move through those changes, particularly those changes that occur as we get older, in a, in a way that's more satisfying for us. The first thing that I found that's very helpful for people is that they, they anticipate changes. And with that, I have a little prop. His name is Ducky. Ducky. <laughs> Hello, Ducky. <laughs> Named by my grandson. <laughs> I carry Ducky with me in my car all the time because I anticipate at some point we're going to have some rain. Sometimes we have some bright sunny days and I need that, that, that protection. But anticipation of change is very important for us. Uh, we oftentimes will, will uh, look forward to changes. Changes that might have to do with uh, graduations, births, new jobs, moving to a different home, that can be very positive. We also have some changes that occur that may not be met with such excitement. Those changes might be related to your health, mm -hmm. it might be related to changes in your income, it might be related to changes in, in the people that are involved in your life. But anticipating those changes is really important. If we know that changes are going to occur, it's going to be a lot easier for us to adapt to those changes and successfully move through those in a way that's going to be much more satisfying for us. The other thing that I want to talk about is planning for those changes. It's, it, it's, a, it's very similar to adapting to changes or, or anticipating changes, but planning for those changes is so important. Many people, again, who come to our office at Aging Partners are seeking some help in, in going through those changes. Mm -hmm. We provide lots of information, and I brought a few brochures here, some things that, that we might help people uh, in their course of navigating through changes. People might be ch having changes in their health. They might be experiencing uh, some um, disease processes. Maybe they've had to have some surgeries. Maybe they are uh, have family members that have now had some changes in their health. And we can help them understand that and also adapt to it in a way that might be more satisfying to them and help them uh, heal more quickly. And with their wealth, many times as we're getting older, our wealth changes. It might be because we've changed in our uh, career path. We might have decided to retire. Yay! That can be exciting. That can also be scary. We can help them. Uh, people uh, plan for that change in their income. We have financial counselors that can help them with that. But it's important to plan. Think about and talk about how those financial changes might, might impact your life. People might also find that a career change is in the cards for them. And that can be very exciting, also a little bit daunting, but people might decide, well, I don't want to wear a suit and tie every day. I would like to be a lifeguard. <laughs> so they might decide that they want to take up a whole different career path that would typically change uh, the, the kind of lifestyle that they have and maybe their income. But planning for that ahead of time is going to make that transition a lot a lot easier and a lot more satisfying for them. And self. Planning for changes in yourself. And that, as we, as we uh, go through life, our perspective of who we are changes a great deal. We might start out feeling uh, a little bit insecure about our abilities to uh, have good, wholesome relationships. And as we move through life, we might feel more competent and confident. And then later on, those relationships might change. So understanding that those changes might occur and seeking out help where you need that. You can plan for some of those things by understanding the symptoms that, that might arise. If you're seeing changes in yourself, in how you interact with people, 
maybe you're becoming more reclusive, maybe you're, uh, you're finding that you're sad, you're crying more, maybe your eating patterns have changed or your exercise patterns have changed. Those are all indicators that something maybe not so good is happening. It's a good time to seek out some help for yourself. Also having family members and friends that you can trust that will step in and maybe offer you maybe a nice, honest perspective of what they're seeing can also be very helpful to help you align yourself so, so you have a more satisfying life. Some feedback. Yes, mm -hmm. that's very important. Feedback from people that you trust. Mm -hmm. And that can be informal, again, your friends, your neighbors, your family, or it can be formal, seeking formal counseling. Mm -hmm. um, for yourself also, uh, having uh, churches, synagogues, groups, clubs, uh, connections to other people in the community, that can, that can add another level of satisfaction to your life that's very, 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 it, well, it's important. <laughs> and then the other part is adapting. <clears throat> now, I have a gift for you today. I have this for you. For me? For you. That looks a lot like a lemon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and you've probably heard, when life gives you lemons. Make lemonade. Make lemonade, right. But you know, it's important to adapt to whatever might happen in your life. Making lemonade's one option, but you can make lemon bars. You can also dig around in there and find the seed, plant that seed, and who knows, you might even grow a lemon tree. The point is, is that you have many options. Life might throw at you things that you don't anticipate, that you really can't plan for, or maybe you've laid out the best plans, but they're really not, it's not playing out in the way that you would prefer. It's important to, to look, stop and look, what else can be, what else can happen, what are my other options, and that lemon might turn into a blessing. I have a little short story for you with this. I have, uh, I have a brother who was, who was diagnosed with a horrible, horrific illness, and mm -hmm. it was just, we were uh, very distraught. And it's actually turned into a very, it has morphed into something that's so very positive because through that illness, he's made a lot of changes in his life. Relationships have been resurrected and healed. He's changed the course of his life, and it's so incredibly positive. That's something that we never could have planned for or anticipated, but he was open to that, as were others that were standing by his side. So that was a great lesson for me to learn. So, so what seems at first like the worst tragedy possibly or something that's just horrific can end up in the long run being something that helps you in so many ways. And not only that, you can probably pass on your experience to someone who might be going through something similar. That's right, yeah. that's right. It's, it's, it's important for us to anticipate changes, to do what we can to plan for how we might respond to those changes, mm -hmm. but then be malleable and ready to change our course, be ready to adapt other ways of responding to those changes that occur. Change is, is going to happen. It's very easy for people to anticipate happy, fun, exciting changes. We look forward to those. It's a little bit more daunting to anticipate those changes that, that we might fear or um, that we might view as a negative. Uh, even though it's difficult to, to think about those things and plan for those things, it's important. Again, going back to having people in your life that you trust, to have those hard conversations. Um, I know that having conversations with important people in your life about end of life decisions, mm -hmm. very important, incredibly important. And not many people do that, do they? Or no, mm -hmm. no. I think more and more people are becoming aware of the importance of that, but, it, but the significance is, is that you have a say. You have a say in how you want your final days and times that are very challenging to play out. And it's, it's good for you, and it's also good for people that love you people that love you and might be a part of your life want to be assured that they're doing what you want, that they're following through on your wishes. I was recently having a conversation with a friend and we were talking about as we get older, is it more difficult to change habits of thought or, or perceptions that we've held on to for a long time that might be inaccurate? Well, 
It can be. It can be difficult. Um, holding on to those perceptions or ideas that that you've had previously um, can give us a sense of expertise. Mm -hmm. It can make us feel more comfortable. Um, so it, it can be a positive thing. But I think a lot of us like to be challenged. A lot of us get excited when there's something new that's introduced into our lives. Uh, being willing to accept perspectives that might not be ones that you hold to be important to yourself can be oftentimes um, uh, surprising to us. We may not have thought that we could have ever agreed with someone else's point of view, mm -hmm. but if we would allow ourselves to just put ourselves in that person's shoes and truly listen, then um, we can find worth and value in the other person. I heard it put listen to learn and learn to listen. I like that. Yeah, I like I've that. never heard of that before. Yeah. I like that. I yeah. like that very yeah. much. Yeah. As we, as you know, again, as we move through our life, um, change is inevitable, both for the person who is experiencing it and also for those family members and friends who are walking down that path with the individual. Daughters and sons and grandchildren might be seeing their loved ones change and uh, be challenged with things that they'd never a anticipated mm -hmm. would happen. Allowing that loved one to uh, talk about those changes can be um, very emotional. It can be frightening, but letting them do that can develop a, a, a depth to the relationship that hadn't been there before. It also is such a healing process and maybe not healing, but it offers support for the person who's going through those life changes so they can um, meet those life changes with confidence and knowing that they're not alone. That's terrific. So just to summarize mm -hmm. basically about change um, and health, wealth, self, and how to anticipate and how to plan and how to adapt. Right. Uh, what would be your final thoughts? Well, my th final thoughts are on that are to um, look forward to whatever life might bring you. There's going to be many adventures and what we might think of as being something that's formidable may actually be a blessing, might be a gift that, that unfolds into something unimaginable. And be willing to be a part of other people's lives. Mm -hmm. That's, I guess I have two final thoughts. <laughs> Listening and watching out for your neighbor, your family members, because they're going to be traveling through, through changes in their lives and lending that hand, that's, that's going to be very important. That's, that's terrific. And it makes life much easier and much more worthwhile when we can adapt to change, correct? I think so. so yeah. I well, think that's, so. That's terrific. Well, Sandy, I can't thank you enough. I am so grateful for the work you're doing at Aging Partners and in the community, and also everywhere that you're, <laughs> that you're helping out, because I know you're helping out in several places. So. Well, thanks. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, Tom. Thanks yeah. for inviting me today. My guest today has been Sandy Lutz from Aging Partners, and we've been talking about change. And I just want you to remember that it is never, ever too late to live and learn.